It'll start mm -hmm. right now. I'm first to go here. Great, boy. First of all, good evening, everybody. It is just evening. amazing to see so many people here. I'm so happy about that. Everybody can hear me? Yes, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to our OGS members. And we have a lot of guests, too. I think that's just wonderful to have so many guests. Can we welcome the guests or should we do it later? And I'm welcoming them and I mean, just have them introduce themselves. We can. No, that. timekeeper says no. No, <laughs> no. Keep moving. And, and, and Deborah, I have your backup, my daughter. She's going to be a moderator, timekeeper, too. Good. Okay. At any rate, I hope everybody's enjoying their holidays Christmas, Kwanzaa, everything that comes around this time of the year. Wishing you a happy new year. Indeed, indeed. And I want to welcome you to our very first virtual, well, virtual or not virtual, show and tell. This was an idea that uh, Linda had. She was invited by the Nashville chapter of OBS to their show and tell. So she suggested to me that we do that with our chapter. And I said, I think that's a great idea because it's something that I have done with my at family reunions, two family reunions, we did this very thing and it worked out very, very well. So I was just amazed to see so much interest. And I was very happy to see it. So many people signed up, had to actually turn some of you away. I'm sorry to have done that, but I think we're going to do this again sometime. So I look forward to that. So um, what amazed me so much besides the numbers is how moved I was by what some of you are going to be talking about. I mean, some things literally just got me choked up inside. I don't want to give anything away, so I'm not going to tell you just what it might be the same for you. I was also amazed that some people had photographs and things that were so old, past count for so many years, wish that I had. And anyway, I think this is going to be a great experience, and I hope you enjoy it. Do let us know. And so, since I only get to talk for one minute, I'm going to turn it over now to Carol so we can get the show on the road. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's so good to see everyone. And even though we're in a distant areas, um, it's nice to have a meeting of the mind and meeting of people that share similar interests. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to give a note to the presenters that we have timed of three minutes. So you'll, we'll have a timer and just to keep things flowing, there'll be a reminder when the three minutes is up. And then I also want to remind everybody to please mute, 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 because uh, when the presenters are talking, we are going to be able to listen if there's background noises. So for that, I want to start with our first presenter, which is Bernice Bennett. And thank you, Bernice. Okay. I'm going to start off with a photo of my grandmother. Uh, her name is Maddie Kemp Alexander. And this is a portrait of my grandmother that was made in 1912. Now, one of the things I want to say about her is I never knew her because she passed away at the age of 32 in 1928, and she's from Edgefield, South Carolina. Uh, this is the portrait that the family had. Uh, I grew up seeing this portrait, and we have another one of her, and can you all see this one? Okay, that's another, that's a, the same portrait is, I don't know if one was taken as a, a photograph and one was a painting, but again, it has always been in the family. And she's from Edgeville, South Carolina, and she's on the cover of this book, Our Ancestors, Our Stories. The other is of uh, my great, great grandfather, Peter Clark. Here he is sitting down and he is from Louisiana. And Peter Clark was born in 1855 and he passed away in 1909. And this uh, picture was actually taken around 1906 and given to me by my grandmother when she was 100 years old. 
And what's interesting about Peter Clark is that he's in several magazines. Here he is in uh, Family Tree Magazine because Peter Clark was on- Bernice, if you can stop the screen share, then we can see. Okay. Thank now, you. Can you stop? Okay. Can you see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, he was in Family Tree Magazine. Um, in Family Tree Magazine because uh, they did a story on the Freedmen Bureau. And I found Peter Clark on the 1868 Freedmen Bureau with his uh, mother and his siblings. And so these are the two that I wanted to share. He's in this book called Tracing Their Steps. And I wrote about Peter Clark because in addition to being on the Freedmen Bureau, he was also, here he is, <laughs> this is the book. He was also a homesteader. And so I, Followed, I traced him. I traced his whole life based on a story my grandmother told me that her granddaddy owned a lot of land. So I hope I've made my three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will now go to Alicia Cohen. Carol, I just wanted to remind uh, everybody that if they have any questions, to put them in the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, am I ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm Alicia Cohen. I know many of you don't know me. I'm a new member, but I'm a neighbor of Steve Hammond and I've known um, Linda for many years. Um, what I will be talking about today is two characters, my great grandmother and my and her older brother. And I started out in 2020 with a goal. And the goal was to find out on my branches who was free and who was enslaved. And I'd heard uh, many stories about my great grandmother. So I started with her. Her name was Louisa uh, Freeman Collins. Can you see her? She was born in 1855. So I had a suspect that she might have been free, but I really didn't know. So I started to look at the, started from the, uh, with her parents on the 1850 census, and they were free people of color. So when she was born, then obviously she was free. Um, as I looked at her more closely, I wanted to look at, um, who were her brothers and sisters? Uh, our family had done, for the last 30 years, our family had centered around her story at our family reunions. In fact, one of my second cousins, and this would be her great-grandmother also, is Pat Fisher. And Pat Fisher is a member of, of, your, uh, of our chapter. So, but you know, we do these family reunions and we spend a lot of time on food and everything else. So you don't really get the details of your ancestor. So I thought I'd look at her brothers and sisters. So I went down the line. It would have been, I think the, well, it was the 1850 census, even though my great grandmother wasn't born until 1855. So she was not on that census, but her older brother was, and I clicked on his name using ancestry.com and up came several documents. And one of the documents was the uh, Civil War um, card that showed that he had enlisted as a Civil War uh, soldier, um, United States Colored Troop. And I was really in shock. I mean, this was a bonus because really what I was going for was who's free and who's enslaved and not only that, I found out, yes, this particular branch was free, but also we had a free ancestor that wanted to go out and fight as a United States colored troop. His name was Nathan Freeman and his family, um, his big sister, of course, was Louisa, who was my grandmother and great grandmother. And um, they- this time? Time? Yes. 
Did I say that already? Oh, okay. So I guess I'll close out with the last line is that uh, Nathan Freeman is listed uh, on the memorial, the Civil War Memorial in Shaw, uh, plaque C-52. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, we're gonna go on to Gwen Faulkner. Yeah, that's me, I'm gonna share. You see the screen? I'm sorry, can you see the screen? No. No, uh, we can't see your screen. You. Oh, I don't know why I didn't share. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> <clears throat> hmm. Let's see, share. Well, I'm, I'm, I won't take up uh, time trying to figure out what, why this is not sharing. But what I wanted to uh, show uh, to um, to share this evening was uh, the information of how I found um, uh, the story, uh, how I discovered the story of how my uh, second great grand uncle uh, died. Um, his name is Hardy Gill, and he's from uh, uh, Lancaster. Uh, and so he was on my family tree, but I hadn't done anything with the information um, at all. And but I was looking at Facebook one day, and a friend of mine had just was visiting the new uh, museum, the National Memorial Museum for Justice and Peace in Montgomery, and she shared some pictures. And she just happened to take a picture of the the rectangular uh, um, slide, uh, the rectangular. Um, uh, representation from Lancaster, South Lancaster, South Carolina, and that's where my people are from. And on the on that on that uh, metal uh, plaque, uh, you could see um, I could see two names, and one was hard. I was extremely surprised because this is definitely you know where my people were people were from. So I looked up to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, this was the same person. Then I did additional effort, um, research and found several articles about this, uh, what happened uh, to him. Supposedly he went to uh, 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 James Clark's house uh, and he wasn't home and he um, had a confrontation with the wife, beat her and, um, and threw the baby across the floor. But anyway, he was arrested, taken to the Lancaster jail. And uh, a couple of days he was taken from the jail by a group of men. Uh, and they found him like maybe three or four days later, shot. Um, uh, and um, with many bullets. And of course, you know, nobody knows of the, the, um, the, the governor at the time, um, put out a reward, $250 reward to try to find the people that uh, did this to him. But of course that did not happen. And, um, but, and the lady survived. But what was very interesting to me was to be able to connect uh, um, Hardy Gill being on uh, uh, listed in this mu uh, memorial. Uh, and it was, I, you know, I just took a trip there immediately to see it and it was a very emotional, uh, trip for me to see him and to be able to really then begin to put some stories to the people's names that you collect in your uh, um, in your uh, tree. So, um, so I'm sorry I just couldn't share it, but I do have the picture of his, of, uh, the, uh, his name on the plaque and uh, pictures of the articles that were written about this. So I don't want to take up too much time. So thanks a lot for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to call on um, Jennifer, I'm sorry, Deidre, Deidre, Bryson, Bryson. Good evening, Deidre, Fryerson Evans. Thank you, Carol, all fellow OG members. 
I'm a new member, so to speak, but I did join in 2019. I am sharing with you a death certificate or what is appropriately called certificate of death. It's the certificate of death of my maternal grandfather. And it's important because I needed this to start my trek down history search, so to speak, to start looking for him. His name, Edward Harper, appears on this death certificate. His death date was April 4th, 1985. He died in New York. Approximate age is 89. What is of interest is as we go further down on the death certificate, down to his date of birth. Date of birth shows June 5th, 1887. I was shocked that they didn't put the four digits, just the last two, but nevertheless, there's a discrepancy here because on my grandfather's obituary, it says that he was born June 6, 1897. According to this, there's a 10 year difference. The death certificate shows that he was actually uh, 1887 would have been 98, not 87. His obituary says my grandfather was about 88. It's pretty sad. When I saw this, I was in uproar that it wasn't correct. I do know I can get it correct as being his granddaughter by sending in an appropriate document to New York City Office of Vital Records and sharing the copy of the obituary to indicate his correct date of birth. What's most important, or I should say more important, is that at this time my mother is 90 years old and she actually is uh, losing some of her, uh, I guess, uh, without memory, how's that? And she can't recollect the right year of birth. So I will have to go with what is uh, on his obituary. The other great thing is that he was a World War I veteran and he is buried at a national cemetery. And I will be utilizing those records to support whatever date of birth is correct. This was an interesting situation that I encountered because I requested his death certificate at the beginning of the pandemic. I requested this in uh, March of this year. I got a notice in April saying that they were working on it. And I was very happy about that because after hearing all the horrendous stories coming out of New York with the uh, volumes of- uh, Time. So I'm happy to have received it in June and I've shared it with you just because it's close to my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deidre. I had um, I had a similar experience in New York State too for the um, death certificates. It took about nine months for me to get one from the state, not the city. Um, the next person is Jennifer Halsey. Uh, good evening, uh, Habari Ghani, everyone. Habari Ghani. I am going to be sharing my screen. I hope this works out right. Um, what I'm doing here, um, my two uh, discoveries, I'll be talking about uh, photographs from archives. Um, the first one will be, oh Lord, where is it? Um, let me see here. Can you all see? My screen. No. You see any? No. No. Okay. What am I supposed to do? I clicked on share screen. Select a window you would like to. Okay. How about now? It's showing now. Okay. Um, this is um, my great uncle Luttrell Walker served in World War One, 
in France. And I had this information from Ancestry, just the paper showing his, um, let's see, every time I go up here, showing the paperwork. Um, I received, I subscribed to a blog for the North Carolina um, Cultural Resources Department. It's part of the archives. And they sent an, um, a blog and in the blog, they mentioned that they had received some photographs from another archives indicating that there may be some photos of people from North Carolina. So I just happened to page through those photos and I saw this photo and I didn't mean anything to me really. But as I enlarged the photo and looked at it closer, if you can see my clicker down here in the corner is written in that white ink that they used back in the day. And it lists the name of the regiment, the 349th. This is taken in Hoboken, New Jersey on March 9th. And I said, taken on March 7th, I'm sorry, March 7th, 1919. And I said, hmm. So I went back and I looked at the paperwork from Ancestry if I can, this uh, thing keeps pulling up. Anyway, I looked at the paperwork and I started looking at the dates and I said, well, these dates here, 3rd of March, 1919, Hoboken, New Jersey. And then I go back and I look at the photo. Long story short, I said, I think this is his, this is him. This is his regiment. I said, he's in this photo somewhere. So I enlarged it as much as I could. My father is still living. My aunt is still living. They're the only two people who know or are living who knew what he looked like. And after enlarging the photo, we have figured out that this is him. Oh. <laughs> and uh, we don't, this is the only the second portrait that we have of him, photograph that we have of him. We have one of him when he was a much older man, but this one, I was just, thrilled to find this. And um, I'm in the process of getting a, it's a panorama. So I'm in the process of getting a, a copy of this in the panorama. And then we're also going to have him, his image blown up. Um, time. Time. Okay. Unshare, I guess. Thank you to... very much, Jennifer. Um, now we'll go. To to share? Hmm? Oh. Do I need to unshare or is it okay? Yes, please. Okay, so oh, I don't know how to do that other than to just go like that. I don't know how to, hmm. I don't know how to get the unshare. Up at, up at the top, there should be a little tag that says stop sharing. Stop video, I hit that one. Nope, not stop video, stop sharing. Oh, I see it, I see it. There we go. There we go, thank well, you. Thank you. Um, I, I will now go to Cheryl Hamlin. Cheryl? Cheryl, you're yeah. muted. Oh, there she is, I see her. Yeah, okay, there you go. Um, I have a few items um, from my Hamlin family. And let's see if I can get this turned around here. Uh, as a teenager, there was always an enamel box on the bookshelf. And um, I just have one thing to say. Linda, it says chat is disabled. That's so. what someone else told me, but okay. um, it's not Cheryl seems to be frozen. If we could come back to Cheryl. Okay. Cheryl, um, can you hear us? Cheryl Hamlin, that is. The next no, one no. is also a Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl Hamlin, um, we're going to have to come back to you because you seem to be frozen. 
I'll, I can call her or text her as well. Okay. And we'll come back. Okay. So Cheryl McQueen. Um, hello, everyone. I too am a relatively new member. And um, I will be quick because I am at the beginning of um, my research. One of the things I like about this chapter is um, I've had the opportunity to learn from people who have been so um, meticulous in <laughs> researching their family. My maternal grandfather um, was born, uh, Jim Coley, born in 1870. And so he was like 80 something by the time I was born. So we didn't spend a whole lot of time together. But in trying to learn more about his life, what I have come up against is what I call myth versus actuality. You know, family stories about him going off to Pittsburgh, marrying and getting run out of town, coming back, remarrying someone um, 20, 50 years, when he was 50 years older than her, only to later find out by visiting the cemetery that none of that was true because I found the wife and I found him. So for me, what I am trying to do and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to share with you later is a fuller, truer story of my maternal grandfather. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, our next speaker is Deborah. And Deborah, I was going to ask a favor of you. Besides your presentation, would you introduce the video that you have to share with us? You're on mute. <laughs> there, that's better. Yes, I will share the, explain the video. This is my mother's high school diploma from the Gates County, North Carolina Training School. My mother told the story many times of how she had to beg her parents to even let her attend high school. They were of the opinion that you invest everything in the oldest child. And my mother was like four down from that. And my mother loved to read and wanted a high school diploma so she could go out in the world. The class only had 30 people in it. She would love to tell me, I was salutatorian. And I would say, well, there was only 30 of you in the class. That's a no big deal. But <laughs> I'm very proud of my mother. Now that I have a better understanding of Black history and how difficult it was for Blacks in rural Gates County, North Carolina to even have an opportunity to go to a high school. Along with the actual diploma is an invitation to the graduation ceremony. My mother was secretary of the class. Oh, and by the way, she died in 2014 at age 94. She was secretary of the class and apparently made by hand because, hey, no computers, cut and paste, this little invitation. The school colors were blue and gold and she cut out gold paper and glued it on the side to make it fancy. And the interior listed all the 30 graduates of the school. So I'm very proud of my mother that she got a high school diploma. Education was so important to her and she lived long enough to know that both her daughters, both her children and her grandchildren got advanced degrees. That's that story. As for the video, I was on the National Museum of African American History and Culture website looking for something, saw a link to YouTube, clicked on it, watched a two minute, 30 second video, and my jaw dropped when I saw myself in this video. Not in the speaking role, but just appearing in the video. And I was stunned. <laughs> because the video was from something that happened. Not yet, not yet, Linda, <laughs> not right, yet. Okay. Keep talking, keep talking. Put it on pause. The video mm -hmm. was from something I had done in 2018. 
the museum before the pandemic had a program called District Treasures and Hometown Treasures. And they invited members of the public to come in with their artifacts and they would give you tips, their professionals would give you tips on how to preserve those artifacts. After my 15 minute session, they had me go out to the hallway and do a video testimonial on how great the program was. And mm -hmm. I probably had to sign a release for that. So I didn't think anything else of it. And I just thought they would notify me, I'm a charter member, when <laughs> the video was published. But lo and behold, there I was in this video, I had brought in love letters from my parents for them to tell me how to preserve. And now let's see the video. Deborah will appear at about 57 seconds. The National into Museum the video. of African American History and Culture offers two unique programs for the public in an effort to preserve and protect family heirlooms and treasures district treasures and hometown treasures. The first, District Treasures, is an in-museum interactive program. District Treasures events will be in Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Participants will be able to bring up to three personal treasures and meet one-on-one -on -one with the preservation specialist and learn how to properly care for their heirlooms. Afterwards, the participants will be Here's free Debbie. to tour the museum. Many of the items people bring for review include, but are not limited to, pictures and photo albums, books, family Bibles, postcards, wedding dresses, uniforms, hats, quilts, jewelry, tins, dolls and figurines, and other collectibles. The second program is Hometown Treasures, much like District Treasures, except the event travels to select cities. Participants will be able to attend local venues with educational workshops, professional reviews, and expositions. You don't have to be in the nation's capital to take advantage of the program. Everyday items that you own, such as family photos, military uniforms, farm tools, decorative items, or even wedding dresses, are deteriorating in your basements and attics, or maybe in plain sight, in sunlight, and at the risk of being lost forever. Teaching basic preservation techniques helps us in our mission to save these objects for families and for institutions. Thank you so much. If we don't act now to preserve our treasures, the tangible evidence of a critical component of American history will be lost to the ages. Let us help you to keep our history and culture alive and well. Visit our website today to plan and schedule your adventure to preserve your cherished heirlooms. Thanks, Deb. You're welcome. Thank Let's you, start. Deborah. Quick question. Has anybody else on, the, on this call or on this meeting um, participated in the Treasures Program at Linda, NMAC? This is Jennifer. I've attended uh, in D.C. And, mm -hmm. and Baltimore. And okay. um, yes, Great. excellent. OK. I Moving along, I'm sorry, I was out of order, but I was just curious. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, I I just want to insert. I've been working here, and I was reminded I did not wear gloves. I did not have gloves on, Deborah. So I'm going to have to get out, <laughs> and I've got a whole box because of the virus. So I shouldn't. Have, there's no excuse. Um, we'll go back to Cheryl Hamlin. Is Cheryl, are you on now? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, this, do you see my um, photo album? Uh, was always in my household. As a teenager, I went in uh, and went through the photo album and found this. This is a picture of my great grandfather, Captain James Edward Hamlin, and his wife, Annie Fouché Hamlin. Fast forward to 1977. Their granddaughter died, and we were looking for a picture for her obituary. We looked in a box under the cousin's bed, and we found this paper, 92-year-old paper, the North Carolina Gazette. 
Raleigh, July 20th, 1885. Oh, wow. In that, it talks about a brilliant marriage. Um, the marriage of James E. Hamlin and Miss Annie W. Fouché was instituted on the evening of the distinction and re respect and popularity of the accomplished society bell linked with the notoriety and respectability of the groom were sufficient to gather the assurance that this was the grandest of occasions. It lists all of the people who were there and what they gave. They got a doorbell and a spittoon among others. And then it talked in terms of a grand reception was given to the friends generally on the evening of the, at the new residence. This is actually a copy. The original I took to the North Carolina archives. They told me to laminate it and I should not have done that, but I followed their instructions. So this is just a copy of it. They had not, they did not have a copy in their files and that's it. That is awesome. Great. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Thank you very much. Um, so the we are North now- North Carolina Industrial Association also sponsored the North Carolina State Colored Fair for 50 years. That's the first time, I didn't know they had a publication. That's the first time I've, I've seen that that group had a association and it was founded in the 1870s. Wow. And racism killed it in, in, 19, 18, in 1930. Yeah, there's just so many different things you don't know and you just research and find it many years later. Mm -hmm. That's so true, Mar Marvin. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll go on to Carol Miller. Yes. Hello. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi. Uh, I do wish I knew how to use the uh, computer. Uh, I'm going to read a letter. My grandmother came to Washington from York County, Virginia, and she joined her older sister here in 1905. About 1920, my grandmother married Thomas Christopher Burrell, and he was from a small community called Sassafras, which is located in Gloucester County, Virginia. York County and Gloucester County sit on opposite sides of the York River. Uh, grandmother's sister Lula Ann had married E.J. Lee from Gloucester and they had four children. And Lula Ann had died in 1913 when she was 35. E.J. then married Rebecca. Ray is Lula Ann's son. Uh, my grandmother would tell of being in a skiff with her father as he rowed across the river to visit family. And for the rest of her life, she was terrified of being on the water. Shortly after Cornelia, and this is shortly after Cornelia and Thomas are married, Thomas goes home for a visit and he writes this letter to his wife. And this is what the letter looks like and it's tucked away. But this is the letter and it says Gloucester Courthouse, Virginia, March 25th, 1920. My dearest wife, while I have a few minutes of spare time, I will spend it in writing to you. I am not feeling well at all good tonight. I have pains all through my body. It feels very much like I'm getting ready to have the flu. I have never heard of so much as we have here now. It is about 50 cases around Sassafras. Mm. I went to EJ's today. Ray has it. Rebecca thinks she has it. It is so much sickness out there that I think I will stay out there until some of them gets better. It isn't any of my people sick with it yet, but I'm afraid to say anything because I don't know how soon. I hope this is just a cold I'm having coming. Rebecca said she is going to write to you and ask you to come down for Easter and come over here to see her while you were down here. I would like very much to have you come if you will, because there's so many of my people that are anxious to see you. And I would like to be here so that I could take you around. Well, how is everything around there? Fine, I hope. I received a letter from my brother today and he asked me about you and sends his love to you. 
write and tell me the news. Hope to hear from you by Saturday and I will write you a long one Sunday. We'll close with much love and lots of kisses. Uh, I remain your loving husband, T.C. Burrell. Uh, during World War I, while in the army, Thomas was trained as a mechanic while on a job transporting heavy machinery there was an accident and Thomas Burrell is killed oh. at the age of 45. And he was taken home to Gloucester and he's buried in the cemetery at the family church, which is Bethel Baptist. That's oh. the end. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Yes. Well done. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we're going on to James Morgan. Uh, good evening, everybody. A bar Ghani for those uh, celebrating Kwanzaa. Um, uh, so my uh, submission for today, can everybody see that? It says you started screen sharing, but it's not on the screen. Okay, give me one moment. I, I think I know what the problem is. One moment. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to have it full screen and you still can't see it. No. What about now? No? No. It was coming through the first time. It was just a couple seconds delay. OK. How about now? Yeah, yes. 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 Give it a minute. Oh, it's worth the wait. All right. OK. All right. Uh, so, so this is a picture uh, of my the two people in the center are my great, 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 great grandparents, Joseph and Jane McBride. Uh, they were, uh, this photo was taken around uh, between 19, I say 1905. Um, or somewhere thereabouts. Um, this picture was taken in the Spring Hill community of Troy, Alabama. Uh, and it, it, actually, it actually does not include all of their children, but uh, includes a good, good amount of them. Uh, but my count, they had about 13 or 14 children that I'm able to document. Uh, my three times great grandmother, Alberta, is over here on this side with the scratch mark on, through her face. Uh, she actually was a, mid, a noted midwife in that area. She was one of the first black women, maybe the first black woman actually employed at the local hospital in the maternity ward, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. Grandpa Joe was actually born into slavery uh, right uh, as the Civil War was getting ready to, uh, to, to jump off. Uh, he was one of six children to his mother, Mary Cade McBride and his father, Henry. Um, Grandpa Joe uh, ended up growing up to become a landowner. He had 160 acres. By the time of his death, he was, um, a lot of people know me for being uh, the Masonic historian that I am. Well, Grandpa Joe was actually the first Prince Hall Freemason in my family that I'm able to document. He was a founding member, a founding secretary of Myrtle Lodge 162, which still exists in Troy, Alabama. Uh, and he and his wife also uh, co-founded an Eastern Star chapter, Arnold Chapter 340, which also still exists with their neighbor, Miss Sarah Arnold, who that chapter was named after. Um, when he died, he actually left uh, some land to Holly Spring Baptist Church. Uh, but ironically, interestingly enough, him and the family are actually buried at Elam Missionary Baptist Church down the road. Uh, so he's actually not buried on his former land as far as I know, but he is buried by his former church and by his lodge. Last thing that I will say is that um, a lot of folks know Troy, Alabama for being the hometown of John Lewis. Well, some of Joe, Joe and Jane McBride's ancestors, uh, descendants actually married into the Lewis family. So there is a marital connection oh, there. Wow. And then um, awesome. and one more, and one, and, and one more, which by the way, Grandma Alberta, she might have delivered John Lewis or some of his family members, I don't know for sure. But last thing I'll say is Grandpa Joe and Grandma Jane have been on my mind a lot this year because they actually died four days apart from each other because of the Spanish flu pandemic of 19 in uh, in February of 1919. So it's interesting how here we are 101 years after their, their death and we're dealing with pandemics. So I think in closing the, uh, as, as genealogists, we need to be looking to the past, not just for the facts, but also asking ourselves the question of how did our ancestors answer the problems and challenges of their times? And maybe we'll find some answers for our times. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, James. I just want to add one thing. My mother told me she was about nine years old in 1919 when the uh, Spanish flu was going around. And she said the families that in the town that had it, the health department would come and plaster a sign in the front of their house saying quarantine. So everyone knew who had it and who did not. Uh, I did not know that. Thank you for sharing that, Carol. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so now Stephanie Myers. Yes, okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the opportunity to join you. My grandmother, Elaine Bivens Hall, used to always say to us, a Bivens was never a slave. And I would always say, oh, come on, grandma, that's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, black people, we were slaves. But as I got older and decided to research history a little bit, I went to Accomack County, where my grandmother's family was from, and they were known as the Bibbins family or the Bivens family. And I learned that back in 1718, uh, there was a culture of black people that were already here in America down in Accomack County and our family was part of that group. So I found a document that showed a story of a young woman, a, um, a indentured white servant from Wales who came to Accomack County to work and she met what I think was probably this handsome, wonderful black man from Angola who was enslaved and his name was Jack. And the next thing you know, Mary was in court in 1718 we, because it was illegal for a white girl to have a baby for an enslaved black man. So they took her to court and they were gonna put her in jail for five years because she had had this romance with Jack, who's my great, great seven generations back grandfather. Well, interestingly, the slave master, Edmund Scarborough, who owned the plantation where Jack was a slave and Mary was an indentured, he bailed them out. So they went back to court four or five times. They had about five children and that was the beginning of the Bivens family. And because black children took on the status of their mother because Mary Bivens was an indentured slave, and excuse me, an indentured worker, white girl, she was not a slave. So my grandmother's admonition to us, you can do what you wanna do because a Bivens was never a slave. That's what she would say all the time. Well, she was right, the Bivenses or the Bivens as they were known. And then I brought a picture which hopefully Audrey can pull up. It's a picture of one of the descendants of the family and his name was Captain Horace W. Bivens. And he was a member of the 10th US Cavalry, one of the original Buffalo soldiers. And he fought in the Spanish American War. And this particular brother, uh, he's a great, great cousin, Captain Horace Bivens, he achieved some notoriety. He got three gold medals and he was a great marksman. And he had a wonderful dog that was very, very skilled and, and worked in the army as well. So that is one of the descendants of the Bivens clan, uh, Captain Horace Bivens. And I'm proud of the family going back to the early 1700s before the Revolutionary War. We had charter families in America who were black and we need to to say that and be proud of that, and I am. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Stephanie. And now um, we'll go on to Steve Hammond. Steve? Hi there, Hi there. yeah, good evening, everybody. Hi. Uh, I want to share with you, I don't know if you'll be able to see this very well, but this is my second great grandmother, Margaret Syfax. And she was um, the daughter of Nancy Syfax, who basically was enslaved at the Decatur House in Washington, D.C. And so I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, about Margaret. Uh, she was born around 1818. Uh, we believe that she was sold down the river approximately 18, between 1830 and 1835. So she would have been sold as a, as a young teenager. Uh, and for the last 20 years or so, we've been trying to identify what happened to Margaret. And this last several months, we've actually located her owner. It turns out that she was actually sold to a woman, here is a, I wanted to show you this other piece here. You can see here, this is a document of her son, Peter Joseph. He was actually in the uh, United States Colored Troops. And when he enlisted, he basically was asked, were you a slave? And he responded that he 
his father basically purchased his freedom from this woman named Mize Cornfranz. And I had no, I, I, you know, I played with that name over and over, could not figure out what it was. And so finally, uh, we played with spellings. We, we haven't been able to find this person. I've had that um, uh, a military pension document in my hands probably for about 25 years. And in the last two months, we've actually found Mize Cornfranz. And it turns out that Mize Cornfranz is, we had it spelled incorrectly. But it turns out that in the 1850, 1860 census, as we were starting to look at the uh, Margaret Syfax fan club, the people who were near her family, associates and neighbors, we actually found a woman named Louise Cornfran. And we also found a, a woman named Cornfran in the 1860 census. But in that census, it was an M Cornfran. So that kind of ties it back to Mai's corn fran. So here is the other one. Here's Mai's corn fran. This happens to also be the 1850 schedule or slave schedule census. And you can see Mai's corn fran actually had six people that lived in her home. In the census, she basically declared herself a, a woman of color from San Domingo. So surprise, it turns out that this woman of color actually owned uh, other people. We believe that Mice Cornfran was probably a, um, uh, entertained people in terms of uh, having a boarding house, but may also have had a brothel. And as a result of that, Peter Joseph was born of Margaret and who we believe to be an Austrian merchant. And so for me, this has been an amazing find. And it turns out that Mice Cornfran has been under our nose the entire time, but we just weren't looking quite close enough. And what it goes to show me as a genealogist who've been working on this for a lot of years is that um, you have to go back, rethink about how you're doing your research and sooner or later, something will pop out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, so we're going to go on to Janice Temple. Janice. Hi, I'm Janice Temple. And um, I wanted to share with everyone about my, my great grand uncle. So I have him on the screen. I'm going to see if I can uh, share with, can you guys see the photo there? He was a Negro League baseball yes. player. Yes. And um, his name is Robert Bobby Anderson. He was born in Chicago in uh, 1899. And so he's over here. Can you see over there? That's a close up of him. Yes. And so this is the Chicago American Giants, 1920. And he's also listed in the book, um, only the ball, only the ball is white. Oh, let me go back to the book. Let's see, let me try. Can you see the book? There it is, only the ball is white. So he was a major contribu contributor to only the ball is white, a history of legendary black players and All Black Professional Teams by Robert Peterson. The book is important um, because it is the first book that recognized Negro League baseball players. And according to this book, he played between 1915 and 1925 as a shortstop and second baseman for Peters Union Giants, um, Chicago American, Giants, Philadelphia Giants, Gilkerson's Junior Giants, and the Chicago Giants. And um, prior to this book, um, there was no documentation of Negro League Baseball. And I've ordered a copy of the book 
Um, and also because um, baseball me memorabilia is uh, very popular, I'm trying to um, go back and um, get <laughs> copies of his history. I've, um, after he died in January, January 25th, 1975 in Chicago, Illinois, um, his widow, Inez Anderson, donated um, artifacts, including the book, Only the Ball is White, to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And I've contacted them to see if they still have his artifacts on display. And I remember as, um, I think I was probably about 16, 17 years old, uh, when they had an exhibition in his honor, I think they had a Negro League uh, baseball exposition. And my Aunt Inez asked my Aunt Charlotte to take myself and my two sisters to represent the family for the exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I distinctly remember the book being Fine. given to the museum. Okay. And so I'm contacting them to see if there's a photo, other artifacts. And then also I'm looking for um, his grandfather in Alabama. So thank you for this fantastic and interesting um, virtual interesting. presentation. Yes, yes. All right, so um, the next person uh, would be Marvin, I think. Yes, Marvin Jones. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My father would occasionally get me up um, after I was about 12 years old to help him on the farm before, he, before I went to school and he went to his store. And one morning he, while we were working, he said, you never knew your grandfather. I said, no, he died 11 years before I was born. I knew that when I was about 14, when my grandfather, Parker Robbins, the, the younger, died. Parker Robbins, the older, was very well known. And he said, well, this was, said, this was your grandfather's hammer. And if you want to know what he looked like, this hammer looks like him. And he said, that camera you carry is starting to look like you. And so, uh, I've had this hammer for since my father's death about seven years ago. Um, the handle got loose and I put a new piece of wood and glue in it. I could saw this off and smooth it off, but that's my contribution to this third generation hammer. Now, it could have belonged to my great grandfather for all I know. And um, I use it a few times every year, although I prefer screws rather than hammers. Also, I brought a quilt my grandmother made, and she made it for me uh, so I could take it to college. She mm. was born in 1887. She was married to my grandfather, Parker Robbins. Her name was Georgiana James Robbins. And when she was working on this quilt, her sister-in-law came over and said, Georgia, that's a nice quilt you're making. Yeah, I'm making it for Marvin when he leaves. Georgia, I like to have that quilt. And my grandmother said, you'll never get it. <laughs> so then my, her sister-in-law went to my mother and said, Claro, that's a nice quilt that, that, that Georgia's making. And I'd like for you to help me get it. And my mother said, the day you get this quilt is the day I sweat with you. Now that might have been my great aunt's way of showing admiration, and so um, I've been I've had this quilt since. Well, this is the 50th year I had this quilt because it was 50 years ago that I left home that I was given this quilt, and I have other quilts that my grandmother made, um, and that's my contribution for this evening. Oh, I do want to say about uh, Deborah Grimstead's mother being from Gates County, which is, neighbor, which is the neighboring county to uh, my county, Hertford County. 
when Deborah's mother was born, there was no black high school. And so um, Gates County Training School was a new, was something very new to the community and, and, and very daring. Most rural Southern counties did not have high schools until the 1920s. Thanks, Marvin. Wow. Thanks, Marvin. Well, thank you, Marvin. My pleasure. Leslie Richard. Is Leslie here? Okay. Okay, so if Leslie is not here, I guess it's my turn. And you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Um, this was as a picture of my great grandmother, Elmira Purdy Bell, who was born in 1836 in Harriston, New York. And among the things that were found at my grandfather's house was one of her cookbooks dated 1853. Now, what I thought was interesting about this cookbook is that it had the sunrise and sunset for major cities on the East Coast in 1853. So it has starts with Boston, New York, Baltimore, and then uh, Charleston. What also interested me was some of the recipes that were in this cookbook, recipes that we would probably not have ever heard of at now. So I wanted to share some of the titles of things that you, they were cooking back in the day uh, in that time frame: Smoked tongue, stewed pigeons, Roasted hare, which was roasted rabbit, venison hash. There was quite a few, um, quite a few recipes for different ways to cook venison, and I know most of us know that that's deer. Lamb's head and liver, uh, hominy, and when it talked about how to make hominy, it's also subtitled it a favorite dish of the American Indians. At the end of this cookbook is a special section that said dishes for the sick. And it had different recipes for you to have for a person in your family that's sick, including calf's foot broth and something that we would probably know now, chicken broth, I'm sure that was the precursor for chicken soup when you get sick. In addition to that, I have um, a small journey journal entry by my grandmother who was born in 1878 in Harrison, New York. And she writes about what um, they had for Thanksgiving dinner. And it says, we observed this day in a quiet way. No one except our own family took dinner, but we had a good dinner. We were all in good health, so we enjoyed it. The dinner consisted of roast chicken, pickled beets, sweet potatoes, boiled turnips, white potatoes, pickled peaches, sweet cider, and pumpkin pie. And then she added no callers. So I guess they didn't have visitors that day. For Christmas, she wrote no callers first. And then said, we had dinner at two o'clock. Mama, Elmira, and Grandma and I were the only ones at dinner. It consisted of roast chicken, smashed turnips and potatoes, baked sweet potatoes, pickled beets, stewed tomatoes, bread and butter, apple pie, cider, and coffee. Florence came in in the afternoon and stayed all night. We had a Christmas tree in the evening from which we got some bountiful lots of candies, cake, mince pies, peanuts, and so forth. And that was the end of her, her entry. Thank you, that was very nice. <laughs>
Linda? Yes, Graylin Presbury. Gray, I saw Graylin. Oh, good. Is he okay. muted? Hi, Graylin. Hi, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm new to the um, organization, but I'm glad I found it. We're, uh, we're glad you found us too. <laughs> um, I too um, uh, use um, Ancestry.com. I'm trying to um, uh, <laughs> identify um, my ancestors. Um, and I recently came across something that was pretty moving to me. Um, and it is the, um, it's the draft card. Let's see. Uh, it's the draft card. In fact, I can probably, um, if I can share, I can bring it up. Let's see. Is it here? Oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. Of uh, my great um, grandfather, John Warren Addison. And um, if any of you know, uh, is it is it coming? Let's see. All right, it's just a little slow. So, um, where did I see that? Uh, he actually served in both World War One and World War Two, but um, here is a view of his um, draft card from World War One. And uh, I was just surprised to see this and his handwriting because <laughs> it's kind of familiar. Um, John Warren Addison, he lived on Warren Street in Northeast Washington, DC. It's near Lincoln Park. It was my understanding that he actually owned three homes um, on that block. Now I knew he owned 240 Warren Street because that's the house that um, my mother and and uh, moved into in the late 60s. Um, he was born in 1889. And it says here uh, that when he was age 28, he lived at 259 Warren Street. So I imagine um, that was one of the homes. Um, I also understand that uh, he was a Pullman Porter, but I don't have any documentation of that. Um, he was also a Shriner. I've, I've seen his regalia. That was how it was, it was um, kept in the garage. Um, and I also have an old radio that I've kept <laughs> that was once I believe it was once owned by him, just judging by the, the size of it. Um, so this is what I wanted to share. Um, my, uh, some, some um, evidence of my great grandfather. Uh, Graylin? Yes. I'd like to make a comment. It okay. says that he was a bricklayer and worked for Harry Wardman, very, very clear. Do you yes. know who Harry Wardman was? Uh, Wardman was an architect. Well, he was a builder. He might have uh, also been an architect, but for sure he was a builder. A and bu he built, I don't know what percentage, but a high number of these, what we now call typical DC row houses. And people study Wardman homes. So it would be interesting to find out if that house on Warren Street might have been a Wardman home. It would also be interesting to know if, um, since you said he, he had owned, you said John Addison had owned two or three homes somewhere. Just yeah, maybe, uh -huh. just, just maybe if he worked for Harry Wardman, Wardman might have, you know, <laughs> given him, give him a deal. I, don't, <laughs> I have no idea, but that's something you might want to look into. And possible. it's possible to do what's called house history research. Okay. Um, you can find out if that house was a Wardman home. There's a whole database of architects and builders of the homes throughout DC, and I'd be glad to share it with you. 
Well, you know, there's also the Wolfman Towers. Um, where, yeah. Uh, Calvert Street or somewhere. Right. Like Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Harry Wardman built not only row houses, but big buildings too. So, yes. Uh, I, That's a- I, I did some uh, research on my neighborhood, and if I'm not mistaken, Wardman was one of the builders um, over here in Southeast. He was a prolific builder. So, oh. you and I can talk about that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's why you came to us. We got to help each other, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay. That's my contribution for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And can you stop sharing? Yes. Okay, good. All right. There we go. All right. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you. All right, Carol. Well, at this point, I want to thank everybody. Everything was so interesting. Well, I just do I share like mine I'm... now? No. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> no, yes. It's I'm nice. sorry. Yeah. I, listen, I want to thank everybody too, but I also want to share couple of things. Um, you know, I love Bernice's story. And can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this lady is Goldie Glover Bruce. She was my great, great aunt. No, no, we cannot see your screen, Linda. Oh, you know what? Wait a minute. It's because I forgot to share. I pulled it up behind here. I'm sorry. Let me get back to Zoom. Boy, share screen. Okay. Here we go. Now. Got it. Yes. Thank you. Need all the help I can get. Okay. So this is Goldie Glover Bruce. She was my great, great aunt, born in Lynchburg, Virginia, 1889, died 1977 in Washington, DC. She actually lived a lot of different places, but um, she, in 1901, Goldie and her parents and her siblings migrated to Boston. But this is a little uh, business card case two inches by one inch, uh, and these little miniature business card cases I found in her house in 19, I'm sorry, in 2006. You heard me say she died in 1977. And some of you have heard parts of this story. Uh, Eric and I were responsible for cleaning out the house of her daughter, who was a, a cousin, obviously, and just found all this stuff in the house. So her business cards, are now at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe, Harvard. And it's a whole nother story about how they ended up there. But in the same vein as Bernice and Deborah Grimstead, you know, we want to preserve our things, but we want to get them published. We want to get them preserved. We're not going to be here forever. So I'm a big advocate for pushing people to get things in an appropriate repository. Some of you have heard the stories about uh, we have some things at the National Museum of African American History and Culture on display. I have some things at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, the, how they ended up in Boston at Radcliffe is a whole separate story. It's a very interesting story. But this was a publication of the magazine in, uh, I think it was December 2019, where they actually showed a picture of the um, business cards and the little case. And also, this was on Instagram from Schlesinger and said that this tiny leather holster, they called it a holster, contains the business cards, da 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 da, da and how, whoops, they were um, part of the materials that I donated. And also in Aunt Goldie's house, there was a larger business card. She had a little business, so and help so, and a female poll tax receipt from 1936. Um, after living in Boston and d- divorcing her husband in 1933, um, her son actually had gone to Nashville first, separate story, but Goldie <laughs> went to Nashville, lived there, and worked as a dental assistant at what is now Tennessee State University, and obviously registered to vote. And so here's a Black woman who apparently had no problem well, I don't know if she had a problem or not, but she certainly was registered. She paid the tax, put it that way. And as a female, of course, she had the right to vote at that time. But what I also like to emphasize is this stuff came from a house that was falling apart, you know, (laughs) junk, lots and lots of junk, but we managed to salvage it. And the only regret I have sometimes is that we didn't save more of it. I saved a lot of stuff but clearly not everything. But here is a list of some of the things that are at the Schlesinger Library at 
Radcliffe. Of course, Radcliffe is the female, the women's school, used to be women's school of Harvard. So these are some of the things. This is simply a screenshot, but if you're more interested, you can go to the website or just search Linda Critchlow White and Schlesinger. So one of the things, when you all were showing some things, I said to myself, oh, I sure wish I still had some of those things in my hands. I kind of get it how we don't want to give things up, but at the same time, we're not going to be here forever. So we need to make plans either to do something in the near future or leave it in our will. One of my friends said, Linda, you need to stop right now and write on the things that you still have, where it's gonna go when you die. So we're not gonna be here, we have to make plans. So that's basically the end of my presentation. I wanna thank everybody. I'm actually gonna turn it back over to Audrey for something fun. Audrey, you're muted. Yes, great, thanks. Wonderful, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you presenters. I think this was just fabulous, lots of stories. What I really got out of this, besides listening to what you had to tell us about your objects was, now we know what you're researching and there are probably people who've listened today who are maybe working on the same surnames or same geological, geographical areas that you might want to get in touch with. So feel free to do that. And another thing that's helped me is that I can now put faces to some of these names because I'm a relatively new member of the organization also. So why don't we take a couple of questions and then I'm going to pull a name out of the bucket here. But we've got two door prizes. Anybody have any questions they want to ask right quick? Let me see, get on the floor. Almost everybody's muted. So if you have a question, oh, oh you know what? Somebody can read what's in the chat. Who's yeah, I wasn't saying to Let's see. chat, but um, let me see. Somebody Most people are just- Ask mm -hmm. James if he was going to have his photograph preserved. James, was your picture an original that we were looking at or a copy? James, are you there? Not. Did James leave us? Um, anybody have any questions out there? Oh, this is Jennifer. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I'm one of those people that's having a hard time letting go of my artifacts. Uh, most of my artifacts are photographs that are um, hundred hundred years or older. Um, and that, that's actually how I got started in genealogy was looking through family photo albums and being fascinated and uh, wanting to hear about who these people were from my grandfather. And when he got ill and we had to run down to North Carolina to bring him up here, I grabbed the photo albums and I was really glad I did. And I've been in the process of having I had them all copied, most of them copied. Now I'm having them digitized, but I still am holding on to the paper <laughs> and I will be making arrangements to donate them, um, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah. hard. <laughs> Jennifer, who is digitizing them? Well, um, what I've done is I've gone to the uh, treasures. Um, I went to one in Baltimore a couple of years ago and I, you know, they were told us we could only bring a few, but I bought an entire suitcase. And when my turn was up, I was sitting at the table outside the um, office there and, you know, kind of going through the photos. And one of the young ladies from the Smithsonian saw them and she said, oh my God, she said, we need to get copies of all of these. She says, do you mind? And I said, no. So I spent another two hours there while they copied and all of my photos that I had. And I said, well, what's gonna happen with them? And she says, well, they are part of the Smithsonian now. She said, um, they may never come out of storage. She says, I don't know what's gonna happen to them, but she, she says, you know, do you mind? You know, I signed some release forms or whatever. And I said, no, no, I have no problems with that. But uh, I just, right now, I just have things on a flash drive 
that they gave me. But um, I've been told that that's not the greatest place to have them. Um, so I'm looking at all different kinds of medians and put them in several different places. So yeah, I need that too. Well, Can I, I have a question for Jennifer? Yes. Yes, did you have to identify the individuals in each picture? No, at that time they did not ask me. They did not ask me. They asked me about a few of the photos and I know I would say uh, probably 90% of the people because I did ask my grandfather and grandmother, you know, who is this, who is this? And they would say who it was. And I did write it down, but I just recently came across a photo, which I believe may be, it looks like a tin type to me that was sent to me by a cousin. And we so, have no idea who this person is in the photo. So Smithsonian didn't ask about the names as well? No, they, okay. they didn't, no, no. Mm -hmm. Can I, to identify can I, who they are. I'm trying to do what they call, um, oh God, I can't even think of the term, but like posting pictures on websites and, and Facebook and just asking people to help identify or- Crowdsourcing. Yeah, crowdsourcing, that's what I meant, yeah. That's I think Marvin, Marvin looked at one of the pictures I had of um, a young man and I love the photo, I don't know who he is, but I'm claiming him. <laughs> it, it came from a cousin. And I, real quickly, I have one real quick funny story. There's a beautiful, beautiful photo I have of a couple um, and their baby. And it's a, obviously a studio photograph and they are so handsome and so beautiful. And the picture is in excellent condition. And so don't know who they are. And it was in one of those cardboard frames from the studio, no hints, no clues or anything. But I put them in the front of the album because I just love them and I just love who they are. And years ago, I was talking to my, my aunt, who's the oldest living member of the family. And I said, do you have any idea who these people are? You know, it's you know somebody in the family, it was in the family photo album. And she glanced at it real quick and she said, oh, I think that's the pastor and his wife. <laughs> and I was like, darn, I thought these were our people. <laughs> but, but they're still in the album and I'm claiming them. <laughs> so anyway. The local TV stations posted a woman and a family right here in DC that they're trying to find who this album belongs to. Oh, know. God. <laughs> album of pictures. Okay, folks. Well, here we are. You must be present. <laughs> Who's that? James, somebody looking for me. There was a question or something for me. I, I'm sorry, I had a phone call. James, we can't hear you. Can, can you hear me? Hey, we can hear you a little bit. Can you, he can wants, you hear me? He wants to know what the question was for him about his photo and getting it. Yeah, somebody had a question for me or something? You, I'm, I'm, I had a phone call that came in. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, uh, one of our members asked whether you were going to have your photograph preserved. Oh, um, I, I would love to, except for the fact that I don't have the original photo. Um, and actually, I, I don't know who has it. Uh, the story goes that uh, that photo um, was instructed me, you know, probably 100 years ago or whatever, that uh, that photo was to be copied um, and given to everybody in our family, in the McBride uh, uh, family. And consistently, I have found when I've contacted different groups of the family that they actually have maintained that for the most part that people individuals will have you know a copy or you know now we live in the digital era but as far as the original goes i have no idea where the original photo is and um and the, what i have i just got a i got a um you know the digital file from my grandfather but i have no idea who has the original and so i would love to have somebody to touch it up but you know it's not there's only but so much you can do with a digital image you, you really want to have the original to work with but um i kind of i kind of like it i you know i kind of like but it gives us a sense of uh of patina i guess you know but um i'd love if anyone knows anybody i, I know adrian gave me a link to somebody uh, if anybody can touch it up and make it a little look a little nicer then i'm all for it i know people have software these days but i've never worked with any so mm -hmm. i can yeah they do. they do can i answer a question as someone asked me sure okay so this is alicia and i think it was might 
Modestine? Modestine, Modestine Lowry. Modestine? Mm -hmm. Okay, so she asked we asked me where my relatives were from, and I I may have left I may have left that out in three three minutes, but it was east it's eastern um, North Carolina, and I think Marvin will know some of these uh, counties, um, Hyde <laughs> County, Hyde County, Craven County. Pamlico County, all those areas, and as far as over where Marvin's family is from uh, in North Carolina, they had high, they had large numbers of free people of color, uh, very similar to, who was the woman, the member who said, uh, what was her family, uh, who had the Welsh woman and she had mulatto children. So a lot of these same families, yeah, a lot of these families are very similar. Very difficult to trace back how they became free, uh, but there were large communities that married free people of color. And in many cases, the law um, did not allow them to marry people who were enslaved unless the master, unless the owner agreed to it. So whole, in fact, if Bernice is still there, um, Bernice did a podcast with um, Warren uh, Milter, Miltier, and he has a whole new book on North Carolina's free people of color, 1750 to 1885. It's something if you're interested in free people of color, Virginia, South Carolina, Louisiana, um, you know, it's a good place to start. Thanks. So thanks for the um, question. Thanks, Alicia. Alicia. Thank you. Yes. I'd, I'd like to add to what Alicia said. Uh-huh. Um, when she mentioned Freeman and Collins, Mm -hmm. I said, I said, okay, they're talking about my neighborhood because <laughs> we do have Collins and Free and Freemans in my in my region. Yeah. Uh, Freemans, particularly in Deborah Greenstead's Gates County, mm. and Collins in the count in my county, south of my county, and Gates County in Southern Virginia. Mm -hmm. Also, I talked with Ira Berlin, who was a historian at University of Maryland, and he had written uh, and. Paul Hennig's book, Free Af Collection, Free African Americans, right. that a lot of mixed race children had white mothers yes. in, the, in the Chesapeake Bay area. And so, mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course, ben Benjamin Bannister's grandmother was, was, yeah. was white, and um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Proctor Thomas's ancestor was a white woman who married a black man. So you had a lot of that in the Chesapeake Bay area and they moved and, and their children and some of the women themselves moved into Eastern North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, Warren Miltier started off his research by staying at, on our farm and I would show him my area uh, when he was an undergrad student. Wow. Now he wow. stayed on our farm and here in DC quite a few times. Oh, wow. And it's just one more thing because I know you're trying to end to close out, but a lot of these uh, free people of color were also triracial. Yes. And especially in Hyde County, where my family was from, and they lived in a small group which was called Metamuskeet. And that's how they were listed on the 1850 census, a clan of about 100 people. So, as Linda said, that's another story. <laughs> and we could go on and on and on, but I really think going back to a couple of the other people that when you're looking at your family, check the 1850 census, uh, the 1840 census. Um, don't assume that every branch in your family was enslaved mm -hmm. because uh, they weren't. So, right. okay, thank you for the question. Thank, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. So that we can move along and we want Linda to close out, but not before we give away some prizes. What do you say? We have <laughs> two door prizes. Since we're all, not all, but anyhow, most of us are doing our family history research. My co-chair, 
um, Carol and I co-chaired this little event, we decided to pick two books that were how-to books. <laughs> we might be past there, but maybe if you don't want it, you can pass it on to somebody else. So the first prize is a book called Practical Genealogy, 50 Steps to Research Your Diverse Family History. Mm -hmm. It's by Brian Sheffy, who I understand mm -hmm. is our, one of our speakers one, one, one of our meetings. I think I might- yeah, Brian has written one of the books about free people of color. Yes. He's done a lot on that. So I know um, Diane Baxter and someone else asked in the chat about books about free people of color. Okay. Yes. Example. Okay, so anyhow, I'll close my eyes and draw a name out. Must be here to win. <laughs> Chris Williams. Is Chris Williams here? Chris? Chris Williams? Chris? Speak now. Okay, gotta go to the next one. See whose name this is. Oh, Eric Johnson. Oh, yeah. Eric, Eric is here. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, Eric, um, I'll send you an email after. Okay. You can see where you want your book sent. All right. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. And the second book is by Robin Smith. It's called Reclaiming Ken Helpful Tips on Researching Your Roots. So, let's see who got that one. Laura Dyson. Laura, are you here? Laura Dyson. Laura, Laura. Going once. Oh, Laura. Going twice. Okay, let's pull another name. <laughs> oh, God. Bernice, that's what you need, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is Bernice still on? Yes, I am, and I actually have the book, so I'll <laughs> donate it to anyone who wants it. <laughs> oh, that is really, really nice. <laughs> want me to pull another name, or are you going to- Yeah, pull another yeah. name. Okay. <laughs> okay, Jackie McCray. Oh, Jackie, you still here? She was here. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. Jackie. Well, Going still a lot of people on. Jackie? We're participating. We've gone down. All right. Susan Hall. Susan Hall. Susan. I'm here. I'm oh, here. Good, good, good. Good. Okay, there you go. <laughs> then let me see you. Say something, Susan, so you'll show I'm up. here. Susan Hall is here. Oh, Susan Gibbs Hall. Hall. Pretty great. Is that you with the bucolic background? Yes, that oh, is beautiful. the is that the um, foothills of Amherst County, Virginia. Oh, All right, nice. it's beautiful. Hey, Susan, uh, that's where my ancestors walked at. My, mine time. too. They still live there. <laughs> that's beautiful, though. Wow. And what was the name of the last book? It's called "Reclaiming Ken: Helpful yeah. Tips on Researching Your Roots" by Robin Smith. R O B Y N. If you want to look it up. So, Thank you. I guess I have your email. Yeah, I have your email address. I'll get in touch with you. I just, I'd like to say that Robin is a local uh, genealogist that uh, presents a lot mm -hmm. also. So we're familiar mm -hmm. with her. In fact, I yeah. just won her book a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I had had one of her webinars. Okay, right. um, Linda, would you like to close this out, please? I think you all have just done such a phenomenal job. I, I just applaud you for doing this. Um, and that's a big hint to other people. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. Don't wait until you're asked to do something, come up with an idea, you know. And, and early in the year after the program committee uh, generated the list of programs for September to June, we put on there that there might be some surprises throughout the year. So this is the first of what might be, I don't want to say many, but there might be some more surprises. So you all might come up with something. Uh, I think Audrey and Carol have done a phenomenal job of hosting this, but maybe we would turn the hosting over to somebody else. I don't know. Suggestions are welcome, but thank you very much. Okay. We all learned a lot and we're looking forward to the next session, whether Carol and, um, Audrey do it or whether somebody else does it. Thanks everyone.
and Thank have you. a good rest of Kwanzaa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very well. Bye, James. Good to see okay. you, James. Bye, Audrey. Bye, everybody. Great job, Bye, everybody. Oh, for those of you who are still Bye, on, everybody. I do this want to remind awesome. our guests, we welcome new members. So Carol and Audrey or I or somebody, we will send out information about how to join our chapter. Great. Okay. Awesome. Love that. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Oh, I Bye. think I saw Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. This has been amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Learned yeah. a lot. Yeah, Good. Bye. Bye-bye.